Hello, my name is Ilsa Miguel and I danced the role of Cinderella in 2009 and in 2015. So I was lucky enough to do it twice. I do remember seeing Cinderella as a little girl. Uh, when I was growing up in Spain, ballet was not very accessible to all of us, neither there was the internet or anything like that. So I did grow up with the story of Cinderella. I read the fairy tale and I loved it. It was one of my favorites. But I didn't come across to the ballet until later on in my career when I finally got access to Yoohoo Internet and I could see videos and whatnot and I fell in love with the ballet. But it was much later on. I probably was already like 16, 17 later on before I, I saw the ballet. I think a lot of people love the story of Cinderella because of what she represents. She's, she's a fighter. She keeps her spirits up and her goodness, you know, even though she's put down and at some point even tormented, things don't go the way that she wanted to go, but she doesn't give up and it doesn't change her values. She stays true and honest to herself and fight for what she wants. She knows there is something better out there and, and she just fights for it. And so we all know the story of Cinderella. She goes from rocks to riches. I mean, everybody is very familiar with that character. How did I make it my, my own? Um, you just have, I just dug into my own personal experience. I, of course, I didn't have such a terrible <laughs> circumstances. I didn't have an evil stepmother or anything like that that put me down. But we all have bad circumstances in life or things that are pushing you down. And you just, I just dug in there and fought for, you know, what, what would I do if this is bad? How would I fight for this? And, and Michael, with working with Michael Pink is fun. Fantastic. He lets you develop a character, he brings character to life better than anybody and he coaches you and tells you what good options are for the role or what not. But, yeah. My favorite parts of Cinderella are quite a few. The first one will be when she comes in, into the ball already with the beautiful gown, with those crystal shoes which are those sparkly point shoes. It's just such a fairy tale moment, you just feel like the quintessential princess and you know the cape and everything and everybody's looking at you. That's like oh it's like every little girl this it was my one of my fantasies. That was a beautiful moment. And then I love the last duet of Cinderella and the Prince. It takes part with her in the rocks in the dark home and I think that the prince finally sees her for who she is, this beautiful human being without a fancy dress, without anything, realizes that she's a beautiful human being in the inside and as the part of the progressive, the darkness of the house changes into light and, and it's, just, it's just, I think, a beautiful moment, I think it's a, it's, I, I loved it. And the last favorite part has to be the stepsisters, the, the dancing, the dance lesson Oh my god, that was one of my favorite parts and every time on stage, a lot of times if you see a video, I had to turn because I was laughing so hard because my two stepsisters, uh, Timothy O'Donnell and Patrick Howell, were just to die for. I mean, I laughed so hard in those rehearsals and those performances. So, And that also was one of the biggest audience love pleaser because they were hysterical. I think I probably had two memories. One is obviously the, the Disney production. I'm a child that grew up on Disney and the magic of it. And of course back then when the designs were, were all hand drawn. And once I found that piece of information out, how exciting it was. But the story is, again, it's such an old story. It's about two, two and a half thousand years old. And it's, uh, it's such a wonderful story with the contrast of, of the sisters and the mother and the tragedy of Cinderella, but the hope. And the other is through um, an English tradition, pantomime tradition. Each year we would, uh, we would go to the theater to see an English pantomime. And as people may know about pantomime, the lead character is usually a man dressed uh, as, a, as a lady. And it's a lot of fun. 
And I remember performing as a wee little child in a production of Cinderella that was all singing, all dancing, all slapstick. And so um, I blame those experiences perhaps for me ending up in this profession. And of course, when the opportunity to come to create a Cinderella, there was no question when people said to me, are your sisters going to be female or male? The answer was obvious based on my pantomime experience. When I was a dancer in the then London Festival Ballet, uh, I played a stepsister in Ben Stevenson's production, which was one we did over there. And it was, um, again, going back to my childhood, it was a perfect role for me to play. I love comedy, I love the, the whole challenge of it. And again, based on the fact that comedy is serious, I wanted to tell the story was really trying to link together the, the, the departed Cinderella's mother, how she came back, because she comes back effectively as the fairy godmother, and how that relationship between Cinderella and her dear, dear departed mother really was the stronger one, because I think in a lot of productions, the fairy godmother is, is never really defined as being other, anything other than a fairy godmother with a beautiful one. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that, that there was continuity there and the relationship between the, the, the new wife who is taking over and is the one who is obviously uh, looking to promote her daughters at the expense of Cinderella and of, and of her newly acquired husband. So those are the areas that where I really, I think the story stayed the same because we, we are using Prokofiev's music and Prokofiev wrote his score very much to the, the, the story as we as we know it. So it was me interpreting that. There was one other element that I added, which was Jack, uh, her friend, who's like the scullery boy, who again is just you know, a, a whipping boy. I mean, if they can pick on him and kick him around the, the kitchen, they will. I made him her guardian angel, so that we see a couple of times the connection between him and the spirit of her mother, in as much as again, that she sent Jack there to keep an eye on on her physically and be able to help her through this time. So I like the spiritual aspect of that and knowing that uh, there's always somebody, somebody, somewhere looking out after you. And as in Peter Pan, you know, for every, every time a baby is born, there is a fairy attached to that person who will follow you through your life and will keep an eye out on you and be there for you and sits right there. Do you see my fairy? See yeah. it. Thank you. <laughs> I think it's very important at the beginning of every project, even if it's something that you think you know, that uh, we just, I give an outline or more than an outline usually of, of where I'd like to explore taking the story and some of the choices that we're going to try and make along the way. As always, the, within the studio and the rehearsal time, that's when we begin to explore what is it really like. So Cinderella, again, the, the, the scenes with the sisters and, and the, the dressmaker and the dance maker, which is such a fun, fun scene. And, um, that was, they're complicated and it takes more time to put them together but if we stay to the principles of making sure that what we're doing is honest and feels like it's a dialogue that actually has some, some continuity to it then, it then it works out very well. It becomes a little bit more challenging. There is there was that one moment where I wanted to have a live bird in a cage, a white dove, um, which symbolizes, uh, well, a white dove symbolizes for everybody, it's the freedom and, uh, and the spiritual world. Um, that we brought the bird, the bird in, in a cage and working with that was, was wonderful because um, I didn't know this until we started that Luth, who was doing Cinderella at the time, is terrified, and I mean terrified, of live birds. So for her to overcome her fear, to sit, so there's a point when we, we found, okay, if I put, if Jack puts the bird cage down on the floor and you slowly crawl up to it like a child would, and it won't freak the bird out and it won't freak you out. <laughs> and that's exactly how we ended up having to find a way to stage that scene because we were dealing with, with loose real, real phobia with birds and then how Jack had to try and keep this thing on his perch. So um, I love that, the aspect of the realness of introducing something that you then have to work around to uh, be able to do, which again, in, in too many productions we see elsewhere, the steps come first and everything else just has to fit in somehow. So I loved making those scenes. As, as with all, all classical ballet, there are, there are usually these big classical dance scenes, etc. And, and Cinderella, the coffee of Cinderella, there is no, uh, there's no, no difference there. The difference actually is the music. The music is so wonderful, but it's quite complicated. So again, trying to create 
uh, a classical vocabulary of movement, the girls on point, the gentleman would be very elegant, a degree of partnering that's not overly physical but is stylistic and, and classical. Um, that was really uh, the point. And it's not, it's not even a challenge. The question for me is always, uh, how do you respond? We have, I have this wonderful thought in classical ballet that an arabesque is an arabesque and a, a first position is a first position. And there are so few basic positions. It's how creative can you be with those, those positions. But again, his music provided us with a wonderful swirling waltz that felt like it was moving on and on. So the way I approached that was to think it was, a, it was people in a garden and they're waltzing through the garden. So it's continually people in the background, the foreground, who are just moving around the garden. And in the midst of that, there are these little interludes where the sisters meet and then the, the prince meets Cinderella and the mother. So it was a, a sort of running montage through that. And at the end, the third act, of course, we have to have a celebration, so we, we do a wedding, pre-wedding wedding dance. And those are, the, those are the pieces that historically in all of my work, that what we call the Court of Ballet work, um, is very, it's very advanced. Uh, and so I think that's something that I, I consciously made that happen because if, if our company are going to get up and dance, let's make it an experience that gives them, raises their heart level, gives them challenge and improves them. Never more so than in Dracula. People who have to do the undead look at it and go, really? I don't think anybody else in the production works as hard as the Court of Ballet. So the dancing scene, I loved the fact that, that you have these two ugly sisters who are desperate to try and be stylish and of course that's the last thing they're going to be. The, relation, the thing to look for is the relationship between the dancing master and the violinist because obviously the dancing master is the one that will demonstrate, if he's allowed to demonstrate, he will, uh, he will show the steps. This is, moment in the piece actually is interesting because it takes incredible confidence to be, to, to milk, milk a situation like that. So Patrick actually took all the time in the world and the longer he took, the funnier it became. And a little bit there with him lifting his foot and uh, Ryan stepping in and saying that's enough. All of that's them reacting to it. And then the musician, of course, who is effectively, he, I think, is a wannabe uh, ballet dancer. <laughs> and that is why he suddenly decided to break out, which is one step too far for our wonderful uh, uh, dancing master. This bit again, that reaction, and that amount of space and time. Again, I can only say that it, it takes a lot of confidence as, a, as an actor to allow that to happen. And Ryan, composure. Let us stay together. Just that little look, the timing of it. Every part, every part of this scene was about these these people playing these characters. And again, we talked, we set this up. We talked about the relationship, but actually, what they're doing is what we talked about earlier. Is very good acting, good response, honest response. Ah, and uh, now that brief moment, which is the first time, of course, he meets Cinderella, is. Uh, another layer of that relationship, but also um, showing that the dancing master is obviously now going to distract the girls so that he can pay a little bit more attention to Cinderella. Okay. Now again, what Timothy is doing there is up to him. We knew that the little things like that, the leg coming up, all of those things were set this repetitive jumping and jumping. One person could make this work, another person couldn't. Certainly these, these chaps hit the, uh, the nail on the head every evening, and it, as indeed did the alternate cast. So much information, but you see, a handful of steps. The steps are probably not the most important part. I mean, they're stylistic, but the actual in relationship between these characters and how they are uh, responding. That's the comedy, that's the comedy. And in the hands of the right people, it can be extremely 
funny. And again, as I mentioned before, all of this is on the music. So the discipline of them being able to deliver all of this, but actually stay on the music, stay together, is the key to uh, <laughs> wonderful. I will say, throughout the rehearsal period, uh, it was as much fun rehearsing this as anything else because the no two days were the same. Anybody who came into the room would respond uh, authentically. And again, that's when you have people in your rehearsal studio who haven't seen something and they, they start laughing uncontrollably in some cases, you know you're doing it right and it's resonating. So again, that's why it's important to uh, to make sure every moment in your rehearsal studio is a moment where you're developing the relationship, the character, exploring, experimenting, and you will find out from them what it is you want to take on stage or off stage as the dancing master just did. Great scene, great performances, great artists. Hi, my name's Timothy O'Donnell and I was lucky enough to play one of the stepsisters in our 2015 production of Cinderella. The first time I saw Cinderella, the ballet, was back in the 90s. Um, it was the Australian Ballet, and the production was choreographed by Stanton Welsh, who's currently the Artistic Director of Houston Ballet. The music was probably the first thing I noticed. It was the, the Act 1 is so painful, and you really feel like you're listening to Cinderella's internal dialogue. Um, and while a lot of ballets do a great job of um, expressing the characters through music, I think Cinderella is probably one of the most brilliantly composed um, traditional classical ballets. And the second thing that really blew my mind, because I was a young boy who was living you know, up in a small town in the country at the time, is that suddenly there were two men dancing on point, which for me just blew my mind, because back then that was something you didn't see. Nowadays ballet has evolved, and we're actually encouraging our young men to take up point work. But for me back then, that was something I'd always wanted to do, and really made me want to do that role. Traditionally in Cinderella, the parts of the stepsisters are played by men, and this is not because it's funny that men dress as women. Um, ballet is a silent art form, as you know, so we have to use many different visual elements uh, to portray our characters. We don't have words, we can't be speaking like we might be uglier people. So, for example, Luth San Miguel is this tall, whereas, well, she's probably a bit taller than that, sorry Luth, I'm about this tall, and I'm also much wider than her, so already visually you have this image that we're somehow different to whatever Cinderella is, which is a really important part of the whole story because it's eventually what the prince sees and what the prince falls in love with. One of the greatest parts of putting this production on stage was that Michael Pink was very, very open with how each of the four men who played stepsisters in different casts got to create those roles themselves. Um, for example, you know, as an LBGT man, I put on that wig and that dress, and you know what? I felt beautiful. So the character I created was this person who wasn't aware that they were different to all the other people. They looked around at all the beautiful girls and was like, I'm one of those beautiful girls. So there was this extreme confidence that was also boosted through the relationship you know, with, with her mother. But then Patrick, who was the other stepsister in my cast, Patrick Howe, uh, he felt really ugly, so he embodied this awkward stepsister who seemed to always not be comfortable in their own clothes and not comfortable in their wig, and that was, that was how he did his authentic role. Every aspect of performing one of the stepsisters was fun, um, but there are definitely some scenes that stood out. Uh, the ballet scene in Act 1 was particularly fun to perform, um, but probably my next favourite scene would have been the ball scene because as the show went on my character got more and more out of control and I, I, I lose myself in those characters and before I know it this, this person who in my head has become a real person just takes over and I sometimes feel like I'm a passenger in these roles and I can distinctly remember just looking around the stage at all of my best friends who were just staring at me and you could see they were terrified about what I was about to do. And, and I was as well, and that, that, that's a, a really uh, special and precious um, experience for a performer. In the video you're seeing right now, I'm putting my makeup on, 
this uh, takes a really long time because as men we have to cover our stubble and we have bushier eyebrows that need to be covered up as well. But actually that doesn't take anywhere near as long as becoming an entirely different character becomes. Once my makeup and my wig were on, usually a good hour at least before the show, I would spend as much time just staring at myself in the mirror as I could until I actually felt like I was the person that I was looking at. And in the way I suppose that method actors work, I would start even off stage to walk, talk, and sort of embody this character that I was going to have to live for the next few hours. And that's the only way I felt that I could do a, a really authentic and genuine performance.